Hello, in this course on poetry as part of metaphysical school of poetry, we are discussing four major poets, John Dunn, George Herbert, Henry Vaughan and Andrew Marvel. We have already discussed two poets, Dunn and Herbert. Now, we will deal with two poems of Henry Vaughan, another major metaphysical poet who was born in 1621 and passed away in 1695. The same historical literary context one shares with Dunn and George Herbert and also Marvel. However, we will look into some specifics and then see how he was able to become a poet and then look at two poems. One is the retreat and another is the world, we will pay attention, more attention to the world and then raise a few critical questions about this poem which are available in the literature on one's poetry. As we noted, similar historical and literary contexts are found in the case of Henry I as well. We found rising tensions between Anglican royalists Protestant parliamentarians. This is primarily for power, who wants to have more power and this power struggle led to the English civil war from 1642 to 1648. At this time, we have this king, King Charles I because of his conflicting relationship with the parliament he was found to be guilty of neglect of duty and then he was beheaded in 1649. The commonwealth took on the responsibility of governing, governing the society. However, we find the tensions between the royalists and Angl Anglicans continuing and taking shape in many different forms. When the royalists and Anglicans were attacked, what happened was they were removed from their power of position. For example, we have Bishop King, he was a priest, but he was removed from his priesthood. Similarly, Thomas I, a brother of Henry I, was also removed from his parish. And this kind of situation has led to what we call metaphysical poetry. And a major part of this metaphysical poetry is religious poetry, devotional poetry, perhaps questioning the right way of life. What is this way of life when we have so much of conflict between two groups of people worshipping the same faith that is Christianity. Herbert we noted was a friend and admirer of John Dan. Now we notice that Henry Vaughan was a friend and follower of George Herbert. Like Herbert, Henry Vaughan was a mystic. He identified himself as a Silorist, that is a place from Wales and he identified with his own place. He was majorly known for his religious poetry and we, we observe that he had some faith in childhood and innocence like what we have in Wordsworth later on. This sympathetic bonds between the microcosm and the macrocosm is something noticeable in Henry Vaughan. His collection of poems is called Silex Scintillance, published in 1650 and it was later on expanded and published in 1655. Three poems are well known from uh, Henry Vaughan, Friends Departed, The Retreat and The World. We will pay some attention to the retreat and more detail, we will examine the world in more detail. Here is the retreat. We have divided the poem into different sections for sake of convenience. Let us start with section 1. Happy those early days when I shined in my angel infancy before I understood this place appointed for my second race or taught my soul to fancy but a white celestial thought when yet I had not walked above a mile or two from my first love and looking back at that 
short space could see a glimpse of his bright face. Section 2 When on some gilded cloud or flower my gazing soul would dwell an hour and in those weaker glories spy some shadows of eternity. Before I taught my tongue to wound my conscience with a sinful sound or had the black art to dispense a several sin to every sense, but fell through all this fleshly dress bright shoots of everlastingness. Section 3 Oh, how I long to travel back and tread again that ancient track that I might once more reach that plain where first I left my glorious train. From whence the enlightened spirit sees that shady city of palm trees, but ah, my soul with too much stay is drunk and staggers in the way. Some men a yeah, forward motion love, but I by backward steps would move. And when this dust falls to the urn, in that state I came return. Let us spend some time thinking about the retreat and then move on to the poem we have chosen for discussion that is the world. This is a poem of 32 lines anticipating the romantic poets like Wordsworth Coleridge exploring their own origin into a happy childhood and the pure life even before birth. Human beings they have some connection with the society and the relationship between the two is understood in terms of the connection with nature and this relationship is further extended to God through soul. This is a kind of microcosm and macrocosm that we notice in Henry Vaughan and later romantic poets. This poem is not exactly about the, a military retreat withdrawing from the forward position. It is actually a spiritual retreat from the world into a personal dialogue with one's own original soul, perhaps something like God. There is a possibility of seeing God and enjoying the company and grace of God. Henry Vaughan also shares similar spiritual connection with God. Our attraction to the world particularly the corrupt world may delay our own steps toward God, but there is no forward exit for Henry Vaughan as he realizes, but a happy return to God with the realization of his own pure soul. Here is the world, we have here again divided the poem into several sections. Section 1, I saw eternity the other night like a great ring of pure and endless light, all calm as it was bright and round beneath it time in hours, days, years driven by the spheres like a vast shadow moved in which the world and all her train were heard. The doting lover in his quaintest strain did there complain, near him his loot, his fancy and his flights with sore delights, with gloves and knots, the silly snares of pleasure, yet his dear treasure all scattered lay, while he his eyes and did pour upon a flower. Section 2 The darksome statesman hung with weights and oh, like a thick midnight fog moved there so slow, he did not stay nor go, condemning thoughts like sad eclipses scowl upon his soul, and clouds of crying witnesses without pursued him with with one shout, he dig the hole and lest his ways be found, worked underground where he did clutch his prey, but one did see that policy. Churches and altars fed him, perjuries were gnats and flies, it rained about him, blood and tears, but he drank them as free. The fearful miser on a heap of rust, sate pining all his life there, did scarce trust his own hands with the dust. It would not place one piece above, but lives in fear of thieves. Thousands there were as frantic as himself and hugged each one his pelf. The downright epicure placed heaven in sense and scorned pretense, while others slipped into a wide excess, said little less. The wicker sought 
slight trivial wares and slave who think them brave poor despised truth said counting by their victory. Section 4. Yet some who all this while did weep and sing and sing and weep soared up into the ring but a most would use no wing. O fool said I thus to prefer dark night before true light to live in grots and caves and head the day because it shows the way the way which from this dead and dark abode leads up to God. Yea, way where you might tread the sun and be more bright than he, but as I did their madness so discuss, one whispered thus, the ring the bridegroom did for none provide but for his bride. You would have noticed through the highlights or highlighted words certain significant aspects of this poem by now. We have a number of questions which will help us understand this poem much better. These, uh, these questions are part of the oppositional strategy that we use to understand and appreciate the poem. How does a poem begin? Why does a poet contrast eternity with time? How does a poet illustrate the different worlds that he finds around him? What do the lover, the statesman, the miser and the epicure have in common? How do the people of this world treat truth? You can recall he uses the word despise, people despise truth. How does a poet compare the human world with the divine world? How does a poem end? Why does a poet bring in the bridegroom and the bride at the end of the poem? What do the rings, ring in the opening and ring at the end have in common or what do they do? What is the attitude of the speaker to the world? From the poet, from the poem you will understand the poet looks at two different kinds of world. One is this worldly life, material life and the other is the spiritual life. The poet drawn to this spiritual life looks at this material life and finds oh so sad these people are despising truth, despising God, going away from God, thinking about themselves, forgetting another world, the better world. The poem has a wonderful structure, it is organized very well. As you can see the poem has 60 lines and they are organized into 4 stanzas of 50 lines each. But there are three parts that we can see. The first part dealing with the way of God, the second part dealing with the ways of the world. Within the ways of the world, we find some pictures of the doting lover, the darksome statesman, the fearful miser, the downright epicure and other people. At last, we find the poet in the world trying to move away from the world to God through one concept in poetry called bridal mysticism. We have great examples in Walt Whitman and also Rabindranath Tagore. So, the whole organizing principle of this poem can be called bridal mysticism. The poet has a dialogue with God and he wants to reach God. We have a thematic contrast as we have already indicated between two different ways of life. One is godly life, another is this worldly life. This godly life is about eternity and this worldly life is about temporal life. One gives light, another gives darkness. One is day, another is night. God is the groom and the poet, the speaker considers himself to be a bride for God. So, we have this intense relationship between the human poet and the divine God in this poem. But there is always this problem of this worldly attraction. We are attracted to the world and forget about our own origin, our own divine source. A number of poetic devices are found in this particular poem. We have simile, transferred epithet, metaphor, personification, another thing called blazon that is cataloging, listing. 
and chiasmus, paronomasia and the symbol. We have a good number of examples for simile like a great ring, it, the poem actually begins with this ring, ring of light. We also have in contrast to this light, we have a, like a vast shadow, like a thick midnight fog, like sad eclipses. In this sad eclipses, we have this notion of transferred epithet, eclipses themselves are not sad but the idea of sadness is attributed to them. Metaphor, we have in the form of ring, clouds of crying witnesses and clutches his prey. When it comes to personification, we find eternity, time, truth, these are all personified to be something great associated with God. The listing, we start from the doting lover, the statesman, move on to the miser and last at last we have the epicure, the chiasmic structure that we have in this poem is weep and sing and then you can see sing and weep or interchange and sing and weep. This is what happens in life, this repetition of the word or phrase the way, the way here is a special repetition. First, the way ends one line and then the second way begins the next line that is where we have this paranomasia, the symbol of the ring connected with the wedding ring, the ring showing light and the wedding ring connecting the poet with God. When we pay attention to the rhyme, rhythm and meter of this poem, we notice something significant in this poem. We have a number of triplets in this poem in line 1 to 3, 16 to 18, 31 to 33 and 46 to 48. The rest we have couplets, so some rhyme, strong rhyme we have suggesting perhaps the strong possibility of uniting with God. We have feminine rhyme, I rhyme, in the case of feminine rhyme we find double syllables and single syllables rhyming alternately like provide, bride be victory. There are some I rhymes as well, they look like rhymes like scowl and soul, abode and guard. When it comes to the meter, we find that there are many variations. We have dimeter, trimeter, tetrameter and pentameter, that is a foot, that is a measure. Generally, most of these lines are within this iambic uh, iambic structure or iambic measure. We have interesting alliterations like silly snares, wait and o, oh, dead and dark contributing to the powerful impact of the poem on the reader. To form a general opinion about this poem, we have certain ideas. The speaker of this poem appears to be familiar with the world of God and also the world of human beings. He chooses to unite with God as a bridegroom and he himself as bride. It is a religious or mystical poem in the tradition of metaphysical poetry. It crosses the different ways and levels of life effortlessly to suggest the possibility of union with God through the ritual of surrender and devotion then the poet can devote himself to his own friend Herbert who was committed to God and yet one could remain a poet, his own individual poet as a Welsh poet, as an Anglican royalist in an intolerant individualistic urban middle class mercantile protestant society. On the one hand, one is devoted to his friend, on the other hand, he is devoted to God, but these two paths merge in their pursuit of God. We have some critical questions on this particular poem. There are two questions. Is one's poem the world the best or worst poem? 
The second question is, is this poem a poor imitation of George Herbert? So, we have critical opinions. On the one hand, we have the general estimate saying that the first seven lines are wonderful, but the rest of the poem from line number 8 to 60 do not have the same poetic power that we have in the first seven lines. On the other hand, we have a group of poets like Kermode, Simmons, Chambers and others who argue that the world is certainly a masterpiece of Henry Vaughan. Why do they say, say so? They have these arguments. It is not a witty poem like dance, but it is a serious poem. Its images are well developed coherently throughout the poem. Finally, they say it is an original poem, not just a poor imitation of George Herbert. We have so far examined the poems of Henry Vaughan, specifically two poems, The Retreat and The World. We brought in the historical and literary context which shaped metaphysical poets and then brought in the life of Henry Vaughan as a devoted, committed religious poet. In The Retreat, we find the poet retreating into himself that is going back to in, into himself and finding out his relationship with God. The world also has similar pursuit, pursuit of uniting with God as a bride unites with her bridegroom. The analysis of poetic devices, rhythm, rhyme and meter and also this oppositional strategy of thematic idea contrast clearly shows that both poems are wonderful poems, particularly the world in spite of the critical questions raised by various scholars. We find the world to be a very interesting uh, poem for us to think about. Perhaps today, we may not have that intensity of our relationship with God, but then in our own moments, sometimes at least there is a light coming into our life and that light may lead us to God or the origin of our own life. We have some references which may be useful to you. Reading Kermode's essay would be really enjoyable and beneficial, very insightful for you. Thank you.